Good afternoon, everyone. Today is the obligatory memorial of St. Dominic. Does everyone know who St. Dominic is or was? Wonderful saint, great preacher of the gospel. Um, the Dominicans based their rule of life from that which St. Dominic has placed before them. In other words, each religious congregation or religious order the Dominicans are in order, and I don't want to go into technicality with you because I'm sure you've heard of religious congregations, religious orders, and societies of apostolic life. Well, in the religious life, there are many classifications. Remember when I told you about the classifications of the liturgical day? I said the solemnity, the obligatory memorial, the optional memorial, the commemoration, the ferial. Remember I told you all about that? There's a classification of order for the liturgical day. Well, in religious life, there's also a classification. Not every congregation of men or women that take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience are in order. Now, I know we say, oh, what order do you belong to? Or what order do you belong to? But not everyone belongs to an order. So we have to remember that. Now, the order of St. Francis is an order. The order of St. Francis, the Franciscans. The order of St. Dominic, that's an order. You know, that's an order. So I was just texting a friend of mine who is a priest and uh, talking about one of the members of the Society of the mission of Africa is coming to another parish to live and taking courses at Villanova. Well, this priest does not belong to an order. He belongs to a society or what is known as maybe a congregation. Now, you don't need to know the specifics of all what I'm talking about. All I think we need to know is that the church in religious life has orders, congregations, and societies of apostolic life. And their rule of life is based upon that classification. So uh, when you think of orders, don't think that everyone belongs to an order. Uh, it might be a good statement to say, Oh, Father, what congregation do you belong to? Or, Sister, what congregation you belong to? And they may say, well, I really belong to an order. Oh. But I think we should hide and say, what order do you belong to? And then they'll say, oh, I don't belong to an order. I belong to a congregation. <laughs> so it's one of those things. Uh, today we celebrate the, the obligatory memorial of St. Dominic. And after their name... You know, you know how they have initials after people who belong to religious congregations? You've seen it with the sisters, haven't you? Like, they'll have Sister Jane Marie, I-H-M. Sister Michael Marie, S-S-J. Uh, you don't even have priests, like Father John Smith, O-S-A, Order of St. Augustine, Augustinians. Well, the initials after the, the order of St. Dominic would be O-P, not O-S-A or O-S-D, order of St. Dominic. No, isn't it interesting? It's O-P. So what does O-P stand for? O-P stands for order of preachers. Isn't that interesting? Like, the, the order does not take the name of the founder. Like you would think OSD, Order of St. Dominic, but it doesn't. It takes the initials OP, Order of Preachers. Their congregation, excuse me, let's get more specific. Their order, really their charism is to preach the faith. Now you may say, Father, aren't all congregations, all orders, all societies of apostolic life to preach the faith? Yes. Yes, they are. However, some pop it up a notch, pop it up two notches, 
pop it up three notches. Well, here, the Order of St. Dominic pops it up three notches. They're like, yeah, everybody, even the common layman and laywoman are to preach the gospel. Even, what did St. Francis say? Preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Well, here, St. Dominic is like, let's preach the gospel. Now, what's interesting about the Order of St. Dominic, the Order of Preachers? They are instructed, learned, educated in knowing the faith. Now, you may say, well, doesn't all congregations and orders and apostolic uh, societies of apostolic life go into seminaries or convents or mother houses to learn the faith better? Yes. But again, pump it up a notch, pump it up two notches, pump it up three notches, and there's the order of preachers. They're constantly studying. They're constantly looking into the mysteries of faith. So they'll be able to articulate it clearly to the non-believer and to the skeptic. That's their ministry. That's their charism. You know how some people say, oh, it's just because that's what I believe. Well, the person just walks away and says, well, that's not up with me a lot. But the order of preachers says, come, sit down, let's have a conversation. And they bring you back into historicity. They bring you back to really the history of the scriptures, the early church, how this all was formulated, why the reasoning, even the reason for the existence of God. How do you explain the existence of God? I don't know, I just believe. Well, not for the Dominicans. They'll say, sit down, let's talk about philosophical, what, what the philosophers talked about, what the early church fathers talked about, what people of faith of years talked about, how we gather an understanding, not of those people, but of science and faith. So knowledge and faith are not enemies. Science and faith are not enemies. They have to work together. They have to work together. Even like the existence of the world, like God created the world in seven days, or six days, and he rested on the seventh day. And then people will refute that and say, listen, I've studied archaeology, I've studied the earth, I've studied this. It did not happen that way. So what you're saying is all false. It's a myth. Well, then the Dominicans will then bring you through and really tell you that the church doesn't necessarily literally mean that the world was created in six days. I mean, who wrote the Bible? Who wrote the first five books of the Bible? Moses, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Was Moses a scientist or an archaeologist? No. So is Moses, is the Bible a history book? No. So what did Moses mean by all that? And what was he trying to express? What was God inspiring him to write? And what was the, the whole purpose and the meaning of the inspiration? So the church absolutely does not hold Catholics to believe that a day, God created this on this day, and this on this day, that a day is 24 hours. How was time relegated back then? What is the study of time and, this, and the, the history of time and the history of the calendar and all of that? And what was the whole meaning of Moses writing that? That God creates that God created. It took God 24 hours to do that? Really? Why did it take him that long? See, we have to be very careful. We have to understand the meaning. Because as Catholics, we don't take the Bible literally. We take it spiritually. 
as the inspired word of God to bring about a message of salvation. So God did this on the first day. It took him a lot, it took him a lot of time to do all that. He made it the oceans, and it's like, oh, I didn't get it right. Let me let me try to make the oceans again. Now, I'm not being disrespectful, but I'm just trying to give you, I'm trying to explain the point to you. That be careful when you, you know, God created this in, in, in a day, or this day. So it took him 24 hours to do it. He couldn't do it in three hours. No, it had to be a whole day. Is that what it means? No. So do you see what I mean about, now that's one example. That's the existence of God and the creation of the world. That's just one thing. Now, for many people say, no, this is, the Bible says it, this is what it means. Really? Does Catholics believe that? I don't. And I'm a Catholic priest. I believe in the Bible. I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. But I do not take the Bible literally. Jesus says, if your right hand calls you to sin, cut it off. If your eye calls you to sin, pluck it out. Why does everyone still have eyes and hands? I mean, let, let me tell you, I hear confessions. Because it's not to be literally. Spiritually. Come on, people, let's understand our faith. Let's be able to articulate our faith. The Dominicans spend so much time in study so they're able to teach and preach the faith. So that people with serious questions about life, about the existence of God, about the creation of the world, about gender identification, that these priests, brothers and sisters, can articulate the faith. Take something very, and bring it down, and let's have a conversation. How about the people who are like these lay kids, lay men and women, in, uh, I say kids, but you know what I mean, young adults, in colleges. You know, they're, they're just saying, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in this, show me this, this is, this is not, God didn't do this. And these are kids that went to Catholic school. These are kids that are baptized, confirmed. What now? Left the faith. No longer practice the faith. Never go to church. Not even Christmas. Not even Christmas anymore. They stopped going to church on Easter. Christmas was cultural. That's why people sometimes go to church. That's why you see our churches packed on Christmas. It's cultural. It's not necessarily faith-based. Although we hope something happens <laughs> when they come to Mass and they, they breathe in the Spirit and allow God to speak to them. We hope and pray. So we never, we're, we're not mean when people come to Mass on Christmas. You know, like years ago, you know, it was all packed. Where are you all the rest of the year? That doesn't work, does it? Let them come in. Let them come in. Come and see. And maybe God will touch them through the celebration of the Christmas Mass. But anyway, I say all that to you because there's a lot of people out there that were professed Catholics, baptized Catholics, confirmed Catholics, educated Catholic in Catholic school who don't go to church, who left the faith, who don't get married by a priest. And when their parents die, they don't bury them in a church. They either cremate them, sprinkle their ashes somewhere, hold their ashes, and just, you know, bury the ashes and then go somewhere else. Go to the reception. I know this. 
That's why I'm determined to talk and to preach and to be here for all of you. I love you. I want to offer Mass for you. I want to preach the Gospel to you. I want to hear your confessions. I want to bury the dead. I want to marry couples. I want to baptize babies. I want to do this all in the name of Jesus. But everybody at home, you have a lot of work to do. Because sometimes they don't come to me with these questions. They talk in your living room and in your kitchen. I don't get them here in my office. Sometimes I do. But they already made up their mind. That's what they say. But see, that's why parents are the first teachers. They teach the faith by what they say and do. And I hope that these YouTube clippings that we're bringing to you helps you a little bit. That you learn the faith, that you're able to articulate the faith. Because my, my whole job is to help you live the faith and teach the faith. You know, I want, I want you to be equipped with the knowledge and the faith of the church. Enable you to sit down with people when they, when they talk to you, whether it's neighbors, relatives, friends, or your children or grandchildren. I mean, I know it's nice to say, oh, it's, honey, it's because I believe. I can't explain it to you. Well, sometimes that does happen, you know, where, where grandparents or parents say to children, I, I know what you're saying, but I, I can't explain it to you. I just believe. Well, I understand that, but I think we need to move to the next level like the Dominicans. Like, come on, let's charge our batteries up and let's say, wait a minute, I can explain this to you. This is why I believe, because this is what the church teaches. And let me try to articulate what the church teaches to you. You know, then you have a conversation. How about with human life? You know, abortion, euthanasia. What about all those situations? That life begins at the first moment of conception and develops in all of its stages. And then it regresses at the end before it goes to God. How do we, how do we respect the life in its early stages and its end stages? You know, in the middle, everyone's like, oh, fine, fine, you know. We're, we're, we're shooting for all lives matter, all through the ages. But how about these little fetuses in the womb of a mother? Do they count? Do their lives matter? I want to ask you that question. Do their lives matter? White, black, Asian, Mexican, Puerto Rican? Who, human life. Does human life matter? Well, if it does, we should never kill human life in the womb of a mother. Even if the law says that it's permissible, there's a higher law, a divine law, a moral law. And how about the end of life? We just don't kill somebody, euthanasia, you know, mercy killing. There's a little bit more that we have to understand, like articulate, what do you mean? Are we allowed to pull the plugs? Are we allowed to stop nutrition and hydration? Are we allowed to uh, stop morphine? Like what are we allowed, morally speaking, to do and not to do with human life? 
We just have to be very careful when it comes to that. So when you have questions about that, call your parish priest. I'm here at St. Mary's, and you have parish priests all over. Call your parish priest. Google the Center for Bioethics. Remember I told you about that before? The Center for Bioethics. Do you have your medical advanced directives already filled out? I'm going to keep on telling you about that. You need to have that done. And I'd rather have it done when you're healthy, wealthy, and wise. Okay, maybe just healthy, wealthy. I mean healthy and wise. <laughs> Who's really wealthy, really? So, do you have that filled out? Let's work on that, okay? But today is the obligatory memorial of Saint Dominic. Order of Preachers. What does the church actually teach in the name of Jesus Christ? What did Jesus Christ actually teach? And how did Jesus Christ articulate that in all the situations today? So you, you may say to me, Father, there was never in the Bible anything about, you know, this, that, that yeah, that we deal with today. Right? So what does Jesus say about that? Because it's not recorded in the scriptures. Or is it? Or is it? The Catholic Church believes that the scriptures are timeless and that everything from the time of Christ to the time of the end of the world is contained within the scriptures. And we have to like dig it out. Or as I told you before, discover it. Oh, it's there. It is absolutely there. So again, not literally, but it's there. And the church has to be there to say, what does Christ say? So don't say, what does the church teach about this? <laughs> Just say, what does Jesus teach about it? And how does the church articulate it? That's how I, that's how I view it. So when someone says, what does the church teach about this? I say, do you mean what does Jesus teach about this? And how does the church articulate it? Because Jesus teaches it. And the church presents it. Jesus teaches it. The Catholic church presents it. Our question is, what does Jesus say about it? And then I'll tell you, how the church presents it to you. And where the basis of that teaching comes from. What do you think the Pope wakes up one day and goes, oh, let's talk about pulling the plugs of a person. No. It's rooted in sacred scripture, apostolic tradition from the apostles. And then the teaching or the magisterium of the church comes out. You have these people who are theologians, who are people who study moral theology, ethicists. You know ethics? They, they spend their life, like scientists are now, trying to find a cure for the coronavirus, okay? We have priests, sisters, nuns, monks who are who work, who dig, who research, and spend their entire lives to say, this is based, this teaching is based on sacred scripture, apostolic tradition, on Jesus Christ, the teaching of Jesus Christ, and the church articulates it as this. It's not like, what do you think? I don't know, what do you think about that? What do you think about that? What do you think of It's not like, what do you, what do I think about that? No, what does the church say about it? What do you, like, what do you think about the Eucharist? Uh, what do you think about Mary? Uh, you know, 
What do you think about the apostles? Where you know, what what do you think about divine revelation? Uh, what, what, hello. It's not like you know. Let's take a poll. Absolute morality, divine law, the teaching of Jesus Christ as it is articulated and presented. That's the church's job, to present to us the teachings of Jesus Christ in all facets of living. What do you think about living together? What do you think about this? What do you... The church has, you know, ask anything. From the time of 33 AD to now, the church has a statement. <laughs> Do I get excited or what? Well, today is the obligatory memorial of St. Dominic, the Order of Preachers. Do you know, do you know who they take as their secondary patron? St. Mary Magdalene. Now you may think to yourself, what? Well, St. Mary Magdalene, yes, because she was the one who announced or preached to the apostles of the risen Jesus. So they take her as a secondary patron. No, St. Dominic, St. Mary Magdalene. Do you know that St. Mary Magdalene is called the Apostle to the Apostles? Also, my birthday is on her feast day, July 22nd. Now, she was not the woman caught in adultery. Remember that woman was nameless. Open your Bible, Catholics. Let's go. Start learning. Open your Bible. The woman caught in adultery has no name. No name. Nameless. Mary Magdalene is the one that Jesus cast seven demons out. We think the seven capital sins. So she did a turnabout. So they have her as the secondary patron. Well, I hope you have a blessed day today. And we'll continue our discussion about divorce, annulments, probably tomorrow. But, you know, it all unfolds as we discover God's presence among us. Have a nice day.